The title of my talk this morning up on the slide is Church and Culture Becoming Cultural Gardeners. Now, I just want to hold up my hand and, and acknowledge that I'm treading very um, familiar ground for I'm sure many of you here. And I'll just make that assumption. If you're at this event, you're probably familiar with this topic. You've been mulling it for some years. Church and culture are two very big uh, concepts that have been <clears throat> parsed out in a variety of ways over the years, with uh, Richard Niebuhr's book, Christ and Culture, probably being the most influential, seminal um, of the books that have been written on this. So I don't expect to be telling you radically new things, but perhaps offering you a different set of lenses and, and insights that you can kind of frame your own thinking around this. Uh, as Caroline mentioned, um, if you've read the copy for this event, uh, my talk is based around this uh, report that I, that I wrote as part of my work at Theos. Um, it's called Breaking Ground, the Church and Cultural Renewal. Um, and it's hosted by LICC. I think you might have seen the, the link. So in the first part of my talk this morning, um, I want to look quickly at culture, um, circle around a definition, outline a few key dynamics of how culture operates and how culture shifts happen. This will be the sociology bit, so don't expect uh, theological insights here. Um, keep those, save those, those questions in your mind for a bit later. Then, with these insights, with these sociological resources in hand, uh, I'll invite us to think biblically, theologically about um, culture and cultural change and offer something of an alternative framework for cultural engagement that looks to the world of gardening and farming for inspiration. Uh, city labs meets um, the shed, if you will, <laughs> uh, or urban meets the countryside, and I think there's a lot of richness and wisdom when we bring those two together. But I'll start with this big, bold, massive question. What is culture, and how does it change? The slide there obviously captures some aspects of culture, I think more, more, more recent examples of, of cultural expression and some long-standing institutions of cultural influence. Now, it's culture and and many other words like that, are big, slippery concepts. The more you try to pin it down, the more elusive uh, it gets. Now, another thing that I want to, to note from the beginning is that culture and society uh, are often used interchangeably, right? We, we talk about what's the situation in our culture uh, or what are the concerns of our society. So I, I realize there's interchanging, uh, yeah, we use those interchangeably, and obviously there's a lot of overlap between the two. Now, as Christians, we have another term that we use interchangeably uh, with culture, which is the world, uh, which is a theological concept, obviously. I won't get into that. I don't want to be pedantic about these things. I just want to acknowledge that the boundaries between culture and society and the world as a more inclusive category are quite thin and porous, and there's overlap between those two. But in this talk, and actually throughout the report, I focused primarily, uh, though not exclusively, on culture rather than society, acknowledging that there's two-way traffic between the two. And in defining culture, I found uh, a definition by a um, sociologist from University of Virginia, who some of you will have heard of, will have engaged with his work, James Davison Hunter, in his book, To Change the World, The Irony, Tragedy, and Possibility of Christianity in the Late Modern World, I found his definition of culture most helpful. So his definition, and the one that I'm going with, is that culture is primarily a framework of understanding or of meaning making. And, and this framework is made up of the stories, the ideas, the ideologies that prevail in a particular place for a particular people. But also, part of this framework are also the collective rituals, the cultural artifacts that I mentioned that you saw earlier that both instantiate or encapsulate uh, the, the ideas and the narratives and the ideologies and generate fresh ones. There is no pure reflection of these ideas. There's always a, 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 
a, a cycle of mutual kind of generation. And there is an interplay between the immaterial and the material. Ideas generate tangible expressions, and those tangible expressions, think of films, songs, uh, or uh, the mall experience, that itself reinforces certain ideas and ideologies, and so on and so forth. Um, but really, thinking of it as a framework is not entirely helpful. I think it's more like the air we breathe. Um, it's the air we breathe. Culture is more like this uh, cloud of fog that you are kind of immersed in, and that shapes the perception of what's around you. Okay, if this is something of a definition of culture, obviously highly contestable because there's many ways to, to parse this. Uh, what are some of the dynamics of culture? The booklet, uh, the short book that I mentioned itself looks at several influential theories of cultural change, but here obviously uh, because I'm constrained for time, I just wanna give you a, a quick tour through the key dynamics that I've picked up in my work. First thing to say, and they're not necessarily in the order uh, on the slide, culture is a complex system. And I'm using complex system um, in its more technical sense, which is to say that a system is complex when every part um, is, is tightly knit with the other. If you remove one, everything else changes or breaks down. So com culture is a complex system that has multiple variables, multiple feedback loops, and importantly, an uneven distribution of power. Some people, some individuals, some institutions, some sectors have more power than others in the cultural landscape. The LSE has more power to shape economic policy and thinking than um, some uh, university that is probably in the top thousand and in the bottom thousand of the top universities in the world, in the rankings. Uh, the iPhone 14 or the Apple products are more influential in shaping um, our, our, our aesthetic sensibilities, the way we relate to the world, to ourselves, than some, um, some tool that, we, uh, that someone produces that never reaches the market and the reach that Apple products have. Those artists have more platform than independent artists that you might really appreciate and see um, in some ramshackle venue on a Wednesday night, for example. Um, Netflix has huge power to reach so many people. Now, according to the, the kind of dominant theories of change, um, because culture is a complex system, there is no recipe, there is no uh, set uh, number of steps that you can just follow and achieve change and see change happen. You can't engineer cultural change, even if you tried it. So Duncan Green, who is this um, development uh, economist at the LSE, um, in a book that deals with change and how change happens, which often we read for those recipes, for those insights that we can just apply, says actually if you're passionate about change in whatever area, at whatever level, you need to think of yourself more as, a, as an ecosystem gardener rather than an architect, rather than someone who assembles, for example, IKEA furniture when you follow slavishly a set of steps. It's more about gardening, ecosystem gardening. We'll get into that and, and, and try to untangle some of the theological uh, resources caught up in that metaphor. And you'll be doing that as well in the breakout groups. So going back to the question of power, which is not the be and end all of, of cultural discourse, as some theorists of the past have tended to see, think Michael, uh, Michel Foucault, but it is important. Power is ubiquitous. Strictly speaking, there is no power vacuum in the world. Power flows through people, through institutions, so it's a relational category. Now, power also takes many forms. There is power within. We would call this motivation or resilience. There is power with, which is uh, the social aspect of power, the power of collaboration 
more on this later. There is, strictly speaking, more, there is power too. This is capacity or capability. There is power over, which is wrapped up with the notion of authority, which can look like domination when it is abused. So power takes many forms, is unequally distributed. So again, if you are thinking about change, you have to do a power audit on yourself and on the context that you're seeking to, to influence. Your workplace, your, your industry, your neighborhood. But you have to bear in mind that cultural change is actually a very slow process. There's no recipe, there are many variables, power is unevenly distributed, and it's generally a very slow process, with some exceptions. <clears throat> and according to James Davis, Davis and Hunter, cultural change usually happens from the top down and from the center to the margins. From the top down, um, with highly densely networked elites, these are people who have disproportionate uh, power. They're not, elites are not a, a, a fixed uh, group. Every sector, every institution, every neighborhood will have its own elites. These are the gatekeepers that know what's going on, that have the resources that they can mobilize. So change happens usually with those people close to the center of power from the top down and from the center to the margins. Ideas have always been um, brought up when, when the question of cultural change uh, comes up. But ideas, yes, they do have consequences, as Richard Weaver said, but ideas don't have consequences pure and simple. They have consequences when they emerge from or are embedded within powerful institutions and when the right conditions kind of are set in place. That's when ideas have uh, consequences. So there's always, again, an interplay between material and the immaterial. M immaterial ideas, stories, narratives, and material conditions, economic, political, social, uh, institutional kind of conditions have to be in place for those ideas and stories to, to catch and to spread. Again, for those thinking of change, they have to bear in mind these aspects. Also, a feature that came, came up in, in, in the study is that successful change makers um, work collaboratively as the default rather than as the exception. Collaboration is, is just absolutely essential for, for achieving change of any kind. And change makers need to plan for the long term, appreciating that change is a slow process, um, and often take a multi-generational approach, especially for, for lasting change. We'll get onto that a bit later. If you take that multi-generational approach, if you have the patience, then you know how to improvise in the moment when conditions are favorable. Now, just briefly on the most consequential level of change. You can, you can change the laws of a people, you can change uh, a government, you can change uh, uh, certain practices, you can ban, t you can ban uh, smoking, for example, but really the most lasting consequential level of change is at the level of imagination, at the level of common knowledge, what we take for granted in, in our culture. What are the, the values, the stories that just kind of end up in phrases we use without necessarily thinking too much about? Think of equality, um, fairness, authenticity. These are, these are like, duh, these are the values of our Western culture. You know, these have been sown uh, into our culture and into our collective consciousness over many years through powerful institutions. They are now common knowledge. Of course, authenticity is a good thing. Of course, self-expression is paramount. Um, this is where, where change has happened, and not through anyone engineering that change. Um, and we're at this place where we have this collective imagination of these values. And this is why the arts, that's why I put you know, Harry Styles there and Beyonce. Harry Styles is a kind of, you know, newcomer in the sense, in this sphere. But anyways, uh, the arts, 
Creative and entertainment industries have a powerful, powerful role in shaping sensibilities, in inculcating implicitly values. Again, think of Netflix as a powerful cultural agent. Um, <clears throat> some of the things that are reflected, they would say, they're just reflecting the diversity in the world, reinforce certain values. And the work is often very surreptitious because the, the, the narrative carries uh, those values. That's why it takes a lot of discernment to, to see through those things. Um, think of the word, uh, think of the way love has been used in um, um, the LGBTQ movement through the years and how activists have latched on positive meanings and have leveraged the power of the arts to, to create momentum around these, these issues. Again, it just points to the disproportionate, I would say, power of the arts and the creative industries. Okay, this is a whistle-stop tour of the sociology. There's much more, obviously, nuance that, that could be added. But as people with a theological interest and vocation, you're no doubt already thinking about these things through a theological lens, through the lens of the gospel, and you're thinking about your context, about your corner of, of London, or maybe further afield. What are we to do with these sociological insights? There's no recipe, but there are insights that you could apply. Should we all now forget our jobs or encourage our uh, members and our churches to get onto the creative and the arts industries? Mm, maybe not, although we should appreciate the artists and really cultivate uh, them in our midst. What do we do here with this stuff is crucial, right? And this is where, where our identities and, and our sources of authority really determine what we do next. And I know this will seem obvious and could even sound trite, though it's certainly not meant that way, but I think our starting point when thinking about cultural engagement should be quite simply the incarnate son. We need to be seeking a Christ-like effect in culture, a Christ-like engagement of culture. We need to carefully consider the contours of Jesus' biography, the relationships he cultivated, his actions, his priorities, his approach to political and cultural power, because it's in Jesus that we see most clearly God's ways with the world. This should be our starting point for our theology of culture. And of course, there are many things to, to say, and many things that could be under, put under this rubric. But for my, my purposes here this morning, I'll just say that if we are to have a Christ-like effect in our culture, our approach will have to be incarnational contextual, it'll have to be kenotic, and it will look like what I'm calling cultural gardening. Incarnational contextual, kenotic, and it will look like cultural gardening. Now, let me unpack that for us. A Christ-like effect um, will be incarnational and contextual. This means, to just get the, the simple stuff out of the way, that we need to be present in the world, both as the gathered church and as the scattered church in all spheres of culture, including the arts, the creative, and entertainment industries. We need to be attuned to the stories and the ideas and the liturgies uh, in which we live uh, and, and, and that shape our collective imagination. But although we're speaking here in, in, in slight abstraction about culture, the truth is we never really encounter uh, culture as such because culture is not a monolith. We, we encounter specific cultures or aspects of, of culture. Western culture, internet culture, a culture of greed, and so on and so forth. So we need a contextual response because different cultures and different cultural expressions call for different modes of engagement. It goes without saying, and I think it's the premise of, um, of the London Project and what Tim Keller has been trying to do for a long time through Redeemer and Redeemer City, that just complaining about culture or simply critiquing culture, much as good cultural analysis is important, those are not enough. Um, then again, two options that I think are completely off the table are capitulating to whatever forces are at play in culture, or, this is probably a bit more controversial, um, 
trying to take over culture um, coercively somehow. Or even through democratic means, we can talk about that later. After all, I do work for a kind of a public theology think tank, but that's for the Q&A. Um, as followers of Jesus, who is the crucified God, the crucified Messiah, those options are not legitimate for us. So different cultural expressions call for different modes of engagement, celebration, because there are good things to be celebrated in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. Uh, challenge, how do we challenge? Of course, is, is another question, but some things need challenging. But fundamentally, I think our posture should be one of not reactivity, but generativity. Therefore, we need to be concerned with cultivation and creativity. Our response should be creative, why? Because the gospel is a creative response to the brokenness of the world. The gospel introduces, tells us actually, that God introdu introduces himself into the brokenness, the stagnation, the decay of the world. Uh, sometimes things are, even though we're called to be kind of ecosystem gardeners, sometimes things are so broken, so bad, that new things need to be introduced, new ideas, new stories, new ways of belonging, new ways of being community. Uh, new businesses or different ways of doing business, um, that um, those are necessary. I'm not entirely sure about the theory of change in, in this quote, but I love Ivan Illich. I can tell you more about him over lunch. But he says, neither revolution nor reformation can ultimately change a society. Rather, you must tell a new powerful tale, one so persuasive that it sweeps away the old myths and becomes the preferred story, one so inclusive that it gathers all the bits of our past and our present into a coherent whole, one that even shines some light into our future so, so that we can take the next step. If you want to change society, you have to tell an alternative story. It's not enough to complain about the story. It's not enough to complain that authenticity and, and rampant individualism are ultimately dead ends. You have to tell a better story of being and belonging. And I think this is where Tim Keller and those who have followed in his footsteps uh, are doing a great job of not just critiquing these values, not just tracing their intellectual lineage, even though that's important, but also offering the gospel as the better alternative story that uh, speaks to and fulfills our longings the longings that swirl around the surface of these values that ultimately disappoint because they become godlike. So new things have to be introduced. But a Christ-like engagement of culture is also kenotic. This fundamentally has to do with our relationship to power. I've mentioned power already. Uh, the language kenosis, obviously, you will know, has to do with Philippians 2, verse 7, and literally means self-emptying. I won't get into the Christological debates, um, but you can see where I stand in the way I'm using the term here. Kenosis is about how we use our power and the privilege that often accrues to a good exercise of power, to quote Andy Crouch. Um, it is about our stewardship of power. I mentioned that power is ubiquitous. There's no power vacuum. So we have to acknowledge as Christians that we've had a complicated at best and toxic at worst relationship to power, especially in the West. And obviously there are differences. Um, so the perennial temptation has always been how do we get more power? And that temptation can be quite subtle especially when our motives may be clothed in biblical language and sound very righteous, you know, to see more of the kingdom around us, to stop God's name being defiled, or, or such, such aspirations. And we think, we, if only we could get our hands on those levers, um, if we can get into that room, that party, then we would see the change that we want to see. Uh, and there's all sorts of problems with that framing. But to cut to the chase, as Christians, as followers of the crucified Messiah, we need to reckon with the power we already have rather than grasp for more. I love what Andy Crouch says about this. He says, the issue is not how to get more power, but reckoning with the power we still have as Christians in the West. We have more power than we readily imagine, and I love this, 
because all of us are more keenly aware of our vulnerabilities than our capabilities. I think there's a false kind of sense of hum humility that kind of uh, you, you can find in Christian circles. Oh, no, I can't. I'm just, you know, meek and humble. Uh, and I think th the enemy can take advantage of that kind of misunderstood for a humility. We need to understand our strengths in Christ, understand our capabilities, take a good look at our power. So we have to ask, what is the power that I have in my home, in my local community, in my workplace, in my networks? Whether I'm an MD at the top of an investment bank or just a civil servant, a sub-editor, a producer, assistant producer, what is the power that I already have? And here I really find it useful to, to actually break down power further into resources. What do I have? What are the financial means and other forms of assets? What are the networks that I have? Who do I know? And what capabilities do I have? What can I do? What are the resources that I have at my disposal? And how can I use them in redemptive ways? What are the networks that I, that I have? What are the people that I know who themselves have power, resources, networks, capabilities that can be pooled for greater effectiveness? And what are my capabilities and competencies? What can I do? What am I good at? So how can I use this power to serve and to bless others, particularly the poor, the widow, the orphan, the refugee, the marginalized? I think if we ask these questions, we're on the right track with our cultural engagement. When we seek to have a Christ-like effect in culture, our response will be contextual and incarnational. Um, we'll reckon with the power um, and understand that it's for the blessing and for the flourishing of others, not for shoring up our own kind of little fortresses and, and mini kingdoms. Um, and when we do that, I think we will look like cultural gardeners. Cultural gardeners who care for the world, who cultivate and co-create with God in the power of the Spirit towards the kingdom. This is the central message, I think. If you, if you go away with one thing, this is what I think um, is what we're called to do. This is, I think, the redemptive alternative to complaining about the culture or trying to control outcomes. Culture, as painter uh, Makoto Fujimura says, is not a territory to be won or lost, but a resource we're called to steward. Culture is a garden to be cultivated. Now, <clears throat> I've used the language of gardening already. I don't have the time to, to go into the full biblical theology of, of gardens and gardening. I'm just going to give you some, some statements uh, and, and help you understand why gardens and agricultural language is a big deal and I think is really important for us to, to, uh, to use when we're thinking about culture. First thing to note is that, and this is very familiar, the Bible begins in a garden with a cultural mandate. In fact, God is the first gardener uh, who, who plants Eden and he puts human beings and gives them the cultural mandate to, to care and to expand the, the boundaries of the garden. The biblical story not just begins in a garden, but it also pivots around two gardens, I would say, Gethsemane and the garden where Jesus ends up being buried, buried which came to be known as the garden tomb. And it ends, obviously, with a garden city. Not just a garden, not just a city, but a garden city, the New Jerusalem. So I think it's safe to say that gardens are a pretty important image uh, that contains a lot of important insight that we should try to grasp. And I know we, we speak of uh, city transformation and, and uh, as the London Project, you are focused on the urban and there's, there's good uh, sociological and theological kind of warrant for this particular focus because London is one of the, the key centers of cultural production and influence in the world as the video itself recognized. Um, but I strongly believe that the rural life uh, rural patterns of work, agriculture and farming and gardening hold a lot of wisdom for us. I think it's not at all coincidental that scripture comes with language that is steeped in these agricultural kind of uh, and rural worlds. 
going back to the biblical story, after the fall, after Adam and Eve are uh, cast out of the, the garden, the history of redemption, you can see it as the, the unfolding of the human drama outside of the garden. But the project of trying to turn the world into a garden, a place of flourishing, of diversity and harmony, a place of abundance, that's not abandoned. The mission of God doesn't uh, stop. We're called to participate in, in this mission of turning the world back to, to a garden. Um, and as scripture narrates this story, it uses this language. In Jesus' own teaching, gardening, farming, agriculture feature prominently. You don't need me to tell you that. Think of the kingdom as a seed or as a mustard seed, the wheat of grain that has to die first before it can spring up into life and bear much fruit. Jesus presents himself as um, a, a winemaker or someone who tends uh, vineyards, and Israel is presented as a vine or a fig tree. Jesus, through his ministry, portrays himself as the farmer or the gardener who sows the seeds of the kingdom, the gospel, but also provides signs of the kingdom, tangible expressions, manifestations of the kingdom. If Adam was the failed gardener of creation, Jesus, the second Adam, is the consummate gardener who cultivates, cares, co-creates through the Spirit, in obedience to God, a new world. I love how this parallel between Adam and, and Jesus, and Jesus as gardener, um, is communicated in one of my favorite passages in the Gospel of John. In John 20, you will remember Mary um, goes to the, 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 guard, to the tomb and um, meets the resurrected Jesus uh, in, in the garden, just outside the empty tomb. And she doesn't recognize Jesus and assumes he is the gardener. And I think the beauty of that scene is that she is both wrong and right at the very same time. She's wrong to assume that he is the professional gardener uh, that is employed to look after that specific gardener, but she is right. He is the gardener. He is the ultimate gardener who has done a much better job than Adam. He is the gardener who has sown his own life sacrificially to worlds, toward the world's restoration and renewal. He is the wheat that must, the, the wheat seed that must die before it bursts forth in abundance. So we talked about culture and cultural change and all the different theories that kind of try to capture that, but ultimately you can't escape sacrifice. There is no lasting cultural change without sacrifice. I love the way Praxis Labs, an organization in, in New York that focuses on what they call redemptive entrepreneurship, how they define redemptive. I don't know if, you, if you've used that word, if you've come across it a lot, but redemptive, um, they define it very precisely as creative restoration through sacrifice. We love the creative restoration bit sometimes, but through sacrifice. And, and they try to outwork that at, uh, at the level of business, for-profit, and non-profit ventures, creative restoration through sacrifice. So as a follower of Jesus, you are, we are called to sow the seeds of the kingdom, the message of the gospel in people's imagination, minds, and hearts. But I think this, this imagery helps us keep the proclamation and the acts of service, the, the, the tangible expressions of the kingdom together. You have to sow the seeds of the kingdom, but you also work for tangible expressions of, of a kingdom whose first fruits have arrived, but the harvest is not yet complete. So such seeding and planting will take the form of words we speak, uh, specifically the word of the living Christ, and actions performed which, which bear witness to what God has done in our workplaces, in our specific uh, settings, in more strategic initiatives, and ultimately through our very lives as disciples who are ready to lay down their lives for others in order to bear much fruit and thereby testify to the kingdom. So my invitation for you is, if we're thinking about having an impact 
on culture or, or having, developing a healthy cultural engagement, whatever aspect or part of culture we are thinking of, to think of ourselves as cultural gardeners. We have the privilege of, and sacred calling, of cultivating the world with God, of co-creating sacrificially, joyfully with Christ in the Spirit towards the kingdom. And what does this mean more concretely? Well, I think it means improving the conditions that make flourishing possible for as many people as possible, particularly those marginalized or excluded. Improving the conditions that make flourishing possible for as many people as possible. So you could say this is, this is the biblical theological case for gardening and farming as, as models for cultural engagement. But I think there's more. Gardening helpfully captures what our basic posture should be towards the world, towards culture, a posture of creativity and cultivation. But the imagery also suggests a number of virtues and practices that are, I think are essential if we, have to ha if we are to have a Christ-like effect in culture. But rather than me unpacking the metaphor further and telling you what those uh, practices are, I would like us, after the break, to, uh, to split into smaller groups and think specifically about the sort of dispositions, virtues and practices, which are implied in this model of gardening and farming for your cultural engagement in your specific setting. So I'm inviting you to, to think of yourself as a gardener or a farmer, yes, in uh, London, the, the uber city of the world. Think of yourself as a gardener um, and think of gardening in terms of fruits and vegetables, not just pretty uh, little flowers and, and, and nicely trimmed hedges, um, think creatively about what sort of gardening are we actually talking about. <clears throat> so the question that I want to leave for you is what are the virtues and practices that the metaphors of gardening and farming suggest for our cultural engagement? And feel free to, to, to bring in your own insights from your own context. This is for me, from, from, uh, this is all for me at this point, and I will come back after the breakout groups tie my presentation together with your insights, and then hopefully I will also leave a bit of time for Q&A. Thanks very much. <laughs>